Good Friday. How can one describe such a day? The wrongdoing of all humanity putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God, our sin and our debt, overcoming Jesus. Here is our King, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? Just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization. We can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong. The blind can see. The lost are found. We had heard the stories of old. Yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken. Behold, freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing. His plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all, the naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails, our sin stopped his heart, and yet this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us. The bright light of our future all in one moment bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday. Amen. Welcome, church. We're here today to remember. So let's stand 
and sing together the old rugged cross. take some time to focus ourselves on the cross and really tune into that day. So Candace is going to lead us through a responsive reading. She'll read, leader, please read congregation and repeat this refrain. With a kiss of betrayal, Judas believed he was instigating the liberation of Israel. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. 
through that kiss, Jesus made a way for the liberation of all people. See, I am making all things new. With a charge of blasphemy, the elders believed they were protecting their religion. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Through that charge, Jesus showed that true religion is about relationship with God and not human structures. See, I am making all things new. With a sentence of death, the Roman Empire believed they were preserving power through violence. Father, Father forgive them, them for, for they, they don't, don't know what, what they are doing. And through that death sentence, Jesus revealed violence to be no match for sacrifice. See, See I, am I am making, making all things new. With obedience to duty, the soldiers believed they were bringing order and peace to the world by way of a political kingdom. Father, Father forgive, forgive them, them, for they don't, don't know what, what they are doing. <coughs> Through that obedience, Jesus brought order and peace to the world by way of a heavenly kingdom. See, See I, am I am making all things new. With jeers of insult, observers at Calvary believed they were undermining Jesus' identity and purpose. Father, Father forgive, forgive them, them, for they, for they don't, don't know, know what, what they are doing. doing. Through those jeers, Jesus demonstrated that true identity and purpose are defined by God alone. See, See I, am I am making all things new. And with a shout of triumph, the accuser believed he was seeing his hold on the world solidified. Father, Father forgive, forgive them, them, for they, they don't, don't know, know what they are doing. doing. Through that shout, Jesus showed that the arrogance of was new. With three days of mourning, Jesus' followers believed they were closing this chapter of their lives. Father, Father forgive, forgive them. them. For they, or they don't, don't know, know what, what they are doing. doing. Through those three days, Jesus accomplished not an end, but a beginning. See, I am, I am making, making all things new. So will you stand and continue to sing with us and thank Jesus for his sacrifice. Has 
no sting and life has no end for I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb thank you Jesus for the blood of life thank you Jesus it has washed me white thank you Jesus you have saved
Lamb of God, pure, holy, without sin. You came and walked among us, lived among us, with joy shared our sorrows. And our hearts are overwhelmed with gratitude for the generosity of your sacrifice. We are beyond grateful that your blood was not shed out of wrath and anger and vengeance, but it was shed out of love and grace and mercy that in that act, you were inviting us into your fold, into your arms, you were embracing us as your own and as your beloveds, even though we were not worthy and we are not, but you have made it so, Jesus. By surrendering your body, by giving over to death on this day, you have invited us into life, into abundance, but today we remember what it cost you. Today we remember who put you on that cross. And we say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. For your glory and in your name. Amen. Please, would you take a seat? At this time, I would like to invite my dear friend and sister Lynette to come up and share some thoughts with us as we prepare for communion. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. God, to you all hearts are open and to you all longings speak. And to you no secret thing is hidden. I beg you, Purify the intentions of our hearts through the unspeakable gift of your grace so we can love you with all we are and praise you for all you are. Amen. Words have power. Ephraim the Syrian, yes, he was a fourth century bloke. I don't know who, any more about him than that. Ephraim the Syrian said, it is through a word that the hidden things of the heart are made known. And Jesus said, what you say flows from your heart, from what is in your heart. Proverbs goes even further. Proverbs says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Words make the world go round, don't they? And words are how God works too. Genesis tells us that God, the Trinity, merely spoke, and the worlds were created. In fact, this concept is so profound that Jesus himself was called the Word. 
the word that was spoken and flowed out of the heart of God, expressing love, which is the core of who God is. John put it this way. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Well, the very prize of God's creation was when he spoke humans into being. Unique in all of creation, in that we were designed to have a loving, meaningful relationship with God. So he made us in his image, with the gift of free will, able to choose whether to be on close speaking terms with him or to reject him. And in the beginning, just as God said, it was all good. God and Adam and Eve lived in perfect harmony, walking and talking together in communion and in unity. But into the Garden of Eden there came another, with another word, a word of death, the snake, Satan, the deceiver. He came using his words to tempt and seduce, sowing doubt and lies about God. Satan tempted Adam and Eve with three temptations and the fears that go along with those temptations. And these temptations have plagued us ever since. He, he lured uh, Adam and Eve with these temptations, desires of the body, desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. And with these three temptations, he lured Adam and Eve into rejecting the word and the goodness of God resulting in their spiritual death. And the rest of humanity, right down to me, has followed suit, digging ourselves deeper and deeper into self-centered loneliness and misery. These lies grew until death ruled the kingdoms of the world, in individual hearts, in communities, and in nations, as everyone struggled to promote number one. The image of God was blurred and distorted and warped by belief in the lies that Satan told about God. Until, until, at just the right time, God spoke the word to a virgin named Mary. And the word became flesh. Jesus was born. The word flowing from the heart of God. Jesus he was the radiance of God's glory. He was the exact image or representation of God's nature. Jesus, who holds everything by his powerful word. Jesus was born to show us the truth about what God is really like. So much so that he said, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus came to speak the words of God's heart of love to us to correct all the misconstructions of established religion and all the lies of Satan. And how he did it. The gospel tells us that Jesus, the word, was full of grace and truth, love, compassion, kindness, joy, justice, humility, humor, gentleness, wisdom. He spoke and things happened. The blind saw, the deaf heard, imprisoned hearts and spirits and minds were set free. The dead were raised, the hungry fed, the poor, rejected, exiled, were embraced. Water was turned to wine and storms were stilled. He spoke, explaining who God is. He said, God is light, love, living water. God is bread for the hungry, that he is the good shepherd. He's the way, the truth, the door to eternal life. He's the way into the kingdom of God. And he spoke, telling us how to live in that kingdom. He said this, he said, he said forgive your enemies. Uh -uh, go further, bless your enemies, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Love your neighbor, don't judge. Share your stuff, care for those in need. Let go of your anger and your fear and your worry. He was just so beautiful. And you know, he said some stuff that sounded ominous, that they didn't understand yet, but was in fact going to be life-changing. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple 
or my follower must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And we also have the script of a powerful prayer in, in which he told his father that above all, he wanted us to know that we are fully known by God. And yet, even in that knowing, we are still fully loved. Loved with the same love that exists between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a mystery? Loved so that we can love one another with that same love. Well, some who heard him loved him, and, some, and they believed that he did have the words of eternal life. But others, deceived by Satan, they saw him as a threat, and their envy and their fear overwhelmed them. And eventually, unable to hear God's love for them, they had to do away with him. And so one night, they had him arrested. They used their words on false charges. They accused him of treason. They mocked him. They cursed him. They twisted his words. They worked up the crowd against him. They had him condemned to death. Words out of, of death out of their hearts led to actions. And they spat on him. They bit him. They beat him. They whipped him. They crushed a crown of thorns onto his head. And they made him take up his own cross and they crucified him. Time stood still. Would the word live up to all the words he had spoken? He'd called us to be crucified with him, to die to our old selves as he was dying for us. What was that supposed to look like? Did, do the words mean anything? Would Jesus walk the talk? Well, on the cross, Jesus spoke seven phrases, words that proved all the words, proving that, yes, the word is fully trustworthy. Firstly, as they pounded the nails into his shattered hands, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. All the sins of humanity, past, present, and future, were rolled into one, and they were laid on him. And in that moment, God forgave his enemies as Jesus prayed for those who persecuted him. The gates of the kingdom of God were flung wide open, a free gift offered today. Will you receive it? Will you believe the words that are backed up by the person and the actions of God shown in Jesus that you are fully known, fully known, all the secrets, and yet you're fully loved fully forgiven. As Jesus dies for us, he calls us to die with him to our pride, the results of living under the lie. And so we too are called to be people who ask for forgiveness and who give forgiveness. Who might you need to speak forgiveness to today? From the cross, Jesus looked down and he saw his mother Mary and he saw John, one of his closest friends, standing there watching in agony. Even in his distress, his heart of love and compassion for his family and his community burned within him. And knowing and loving them both, he said, Dear woman, here's your son, John. Here's your mother. Care for each other. Care for each other. And you know, this heart of compassion is extended to you today. We are told, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And as we're cared for by God, we are safe to die to our own self-centeredness. We're free to look up and to look out and see that there are people here in our community who need us to be family. And I wonder today, who do we need to care for, to protect, to comfort today? One of the two thieves who was crucified with Jesus and had been mocking him too, suddenly thought about his thinking. This is the process of repentance, you know. And this thief got it. Stop it, he said to the other guy. He said, we deserved our fate, but this guy is innocent. And turning to Jesus, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
It was a humble, repentant acknowledgement that he knew that this was, in fact, God. And Jesus turned to him and said, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Redemption. The thief was welcomed in, known and fully loved to be with Jesus. Though, you know, the with God life is the whole big deal. The thief only got to enjoy a few moments of it on earth before he died. But he's still there in heaven with Jesus now. But Jesus himself said that eternal life is not just a way off there, up there somewhere when we die. But eternal life is knowing God and knowing Jesus. It's the only description that Jesus gave of eternal life. Knowing means intimate, interactive relationship. Starting now as we too, no matter how much we deserve otherwise, repent and acknowledge and trust Jesus. How much greater to live however many days we have left with Jesus than to live in the agony of the lie that we have to struggle on all by ourselves. Jesus will show us how. He will be with us as we crucify our old stubborn ways and learn to live in the fullness of joy with him. That is paradise. You know, it's time to think about our thinking. At the peak of his suffering, Jesus, fully man, cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are words from Psalm 22. The deepest suffering always makes us feel alone, doesn't it? No matter who is around, no one it feels like can really get in here, into my mind and my heart, and touch that deep space, can they? Suffering is just so lonely. And as a man, Jesus felt it. But as God, the truth is that God did not abandon him at all. Psalm 22, that, that, that phrase begins, goes on to say, Praise God, honor him, revere him, for he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cry for help. Although in his humanity, Jesus may have felt abandoned, it is impossible for the Trinity to be divided even for a second. The Father and the Son were present all the time. The Father did not turn his face away. He was there suffering with Jesus, doing the hard work of reconciling the world to himself with Jesus through Jesus. And as God did not abandon Jesus in his suffering, so you may be assured that he will never abandon you in yours either. Darkness does not get the last word in the kingdom of God. No matter what it might feel like, never. Are you ready to die to the loneliness of self and be re reunited with God? His arms are wide open for you. And if you'd like to, we would love to talk to you and introduce you to him. For those of us who already know God and who may be in a season of suffering, feeling abandoned, God is present. As he was with Jesus, so he will be with you. This message of reconciliation, of God's longing for reunion with us, is for all the suffering in our world. I wonder who needs to hear it today in your corner. As his lungs collapse, Jesus fulfills another prophecy, written in Psalm 22 and 69, as he gasps, I thirst. Fully God and fully man, the living water now physically thirsts, as he spiritually thirsts for our salvation. Jesus understands earthly thirst. Our thirst for those, those things that tempt us. The thirst for all the things of earth. The things that Satan says you need. The stuff, the addictions of various kinds the search for approval, the crippling envy and pride. Those false beliefs we have that I am what I have, I am what I do, I am what I think others think of me. But Jesus reminds us that those thirsts are illusions. The real thirst of our souls is for living water. Psalm says, my soul thirsts for thee, my, soul, my spirit faints for thee, my body faints for thee in a dry and weary land. 
This morning, are you ready to, to die to those relentless thirsts that will never satisfy? Are you ready to deliberately, consciously offer them up to Jesus and instead drink, receive the Holy Spirit as a spring of living water that will bubble up in your soul, satisfying for eternity? I wonder which meaningless thirst is draining you dry today. When he had finished the bitter drink, all the work of forgiveness, all the battle to redeem our souls from Satan, all the work to conquer death was completed. And Jesus bowed his head and he said, it is finished. A cry of triumph, of victory. Isaiah, way back, had prophesied this. He said, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so my word that goes out from my mouth, Jesus, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire, and it will achieve the purpose for which I sent it, redemption. The word Jesus came down from heaven, watering the earth, bringing us back to life so that we can bud and flourish and be fruitful in all the ways that we were originally made for. The word had achieved the Trinity's purpose. And you know, in response, as we die to ourselves, may we use the gifts we've been given under the direction of the Spirit to bud and flourish and spread the seeds of God's love into every corner of our world. Jesus' very last words were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He gave his spirit up to the safety of his father's arms. It didn't die. And he willingly gave up his body to physical death. It did die. But death did not take it from him. Death had no terror for him because death was in his power and not the other way around. Augustine said, he gave up his spirit in humility with a bowed head. This death and bowing of the head were acts of great power. Satan and his enemies thought that they had won, but they had forgotten that Jesus had said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord, and I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. In three days, this is a spoiler alert, we're going to come back on Sunday morning to celebrate that death had to release him, for it had no hold on him. Colossians 3 says, death need have no hold on us either, as we accept that we are fully known, fully loved, and we receive full forgiveness for our sins. Dying to our old selves is committing our spirits to the Father. And then we are raised with Christ, and we are hidden with Christ, safe in the very heart of God. As we contemplate the mystery of the crucifixion and all it means for us, may the words of Jesus have the last word. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Amen. The myriad mysteries of the cross are deeply personal. Jesus is longing to meet each one of us exactly where we are to speak the love of God deep into the needs of our souls this very minute, this morning in Rexdale. Reminding us that we are fully known in all our sinfulness, and yet, even still, we are still fully loved, offered full forgiveness. We'd like to, to give you a space of absolute quiet, to allow you to listen and respond to Jesus in the quiet of your heart as he speaks to you personally, from the cross, into your particular life and circumstances, whatever they may be, this good Friday morning. After some moments of silence, Cheryl is going to come and lead us into communion. Take some moments of quiet.
The body of our Lord Jesus Christ has been given for us. Jesus entered our brokenness to redeem it. He did this by his own body. Bruised, beaten, whipped, and crucified. To bind up our broken hearts. To release us from captivity. And to free us from darkness. Even the darkness of death. By his body, we are healed. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ has been shed for us, poured out on Calvary for, for the forgiveness of our sins, cleansing us. His blood breaks the power of our iniquity, lifts the weight of our guilt, and covers our exposed shame. His blood, by his blood, he has victory over Satan and rescues us from the enemy's stronghold. And it's by his blood that those who are far off can be brought near by faith in him. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. When you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. As you come to the four stations, two here on the stage and two up in the balcony, you will take communion from the foot of the cross. As we come, we do not presume our own righteousness. No, we come humbly with repentant hearts to receive from him that which we could never earn or do on our own. We receive forgiveness, pardon, release, freedom, life, and liberty. Take a moment, examine your heart, and then when you are ready, please come forward and receive the communion. Take the communion elements back to your seat and eat of it when you are ready. We will not eat it all together. Receive this communion as the never-ending grace from our Lord. We invite you now.
Find what this world cannot offer. Come and find your joy here complete. Taste the living water, never thirst again. Rest here in his wondrous peace. Oh, the goodness, the goodness. He is all that I need. May it become what may that I rest all my days in the goodness of Jesus. Good. 
is where I lay it down, every burden, every crown, this is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt, this is my surrender. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. where I lay it down every burden every crown this is my surrender this is my surrender here is where I lay it down every lie and every doubt this is my surrender and I will make room for you Do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. Shake up the ground of all my tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better your way is better and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to and I will make room for you Whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. As you draw your thoughts back to this moment, we trust that you have encountered the loving, forgiving, and embracing presence of Jesus. And we trust that the power of this extraordinary and mysterious act of love and surrender will draw you deeper into the knowledge of your belovedness. So I'm gonna invite you to stand as we sing this last hymn together. Let's respond both individually and as the bride of Christ. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
Spirit who dwells amongst us. If this is something that you don't fully understand, we invite you to come and connect with us afterwards. If this is something that you have come to understand and you want to make a decision to live into today, we want to hear that as well. There are prayer partners here at the front as the service closes for you to come and receive, for you to come and share. The cross is always available for you to be unburdened. The price has been paid. As we close, you're welcome to head downstairs, uh, hang a left and down the back stairwell to the Easter walkthrough and to physically walk these stages of Jesus' last days and experience that. There's a QR code for you to scan and see the, the guidebook or their physical copies there. We will see you 10 a.m. 
Easter Sunday to celebrate. And again, the walkthrough will be available after the service with our fine actors ready to bring it to life. So take the time today to understand the sacrifice and the gratitude that we need to have, the, the gravity of what's been done for us. Also that we can celebrate them more on the third day when the tomb is empty. Good. <laughs>